Champions dictate how divisions play out. Number one contender fights, normally you should only have probably one of those until you're declared the actual number one contender, but in the sake of Aaron Blanchfield and Manon Furo, it seems like this is number one contender fight number two or three for each fighter individually, but we have finally reached an ultimatum. The winner of this fight right here should get the nod in the title eliminator for the eventual winner of the Alexa Grasso versus Valentina Shevchenko trilogy match here in the women's flyweight division. Exciting time to be alive, UFC Atlantic City. That's what we're breaking down here today. Welcome back to another episode of the Bloody Water Podcast. My name is Derek G and welcoming me as always, the Santa Fe Bomber, the New Mexico native, the man with a fantastic Bloody Water podcast t-shirt on right there. We'll talk to the people about that in one moment. AJ, how you living, big dog? Derek, I am living very well, my brother, and you're right, man. All roads lead to gold, and it's about time that some of these detours have finally put us in a place where we're getting excited to watch some violence this weekend, man. I'm very excited for these fights. Happy to be breaking it down with you as always, my brother. That's right. We have a lot to talk about here today, of course. We have some real contenders here in the women's flyweight division. We have some ranked fighters taking on unranked fighters, and we're going to break it all down per usual. But folks, before we do that, you know you need to take a look down at the scoreboard below we're doing this throughout the entire year and i don't know how many of your favorite pundits or how many of your favorite mma analysts wagers handicappers are actively tracking their picks and their accuracy ratings but take a look at the numbers both of us above 60 percent i'm aiming to climb right back up to my goal for the year of 70 percent and let the numbers speak for what they will we're not going to mince any more words we're jumping straight into the tldr and we're going to show you some picks my favorite part aj the big screen baby let's bring it up all right, my man, UFC Atlantic City. There's a lot of consensus picks. So I feel like folks, for the time being, take your screenshot. I have no words on this one, but my man AJ does have some words because as always, we have to bring up the consensus picks and the theme for the five picks that we're rolling with here today. What are your thoughts on the consensus picks, my friend? Derek, the theme this week for me, man, and, and thoughts going into it as well, dominance. These fighters need to be dominant in every single aspect of the fight, and, and more often than not, they are. So if they can get it done and not make these close fights, they'll all be pulling away with those victories. And that would mean a lot of green in our pocketbook, which is what we love to see. But folks, we give you consensus picks. We give you the straight money line picks. That's not a problem. A lot of people might say, oh, that's easy. Anybody can do that. Well, you might be right. But can anybody give you some prop locks right here? We don't say prop picks. We say prop locks because we're locking these things in right here. AJ, we got two of them per usual, but we're both riding a two fight win streak, a two prop win streak. Let's go with yours first. Matthews versus Bazookia. Apologies if I butchered under two and a half rounds at plus 130. Juice, talk to the people. Juice, absolute juice with two young younger fighters going into this one, man. Both going to be hungry. Both going to look to make a make a move right here. Two and a half rounds into three rounds fights. I'm looking for the under, and I think the finish is going to happen. And if you want to talk about juice, AJ, I mean, I don't think there's a juicier prop to pick from than the one that I'm rolling with. I'm not just rolling with the live dog, which we're going to talk about. Some Someone's getting exposed this weekend. But Cedricus Dumas, who's coming off of some controversy outside of the cage, I think he steps in here. He does the uh, fraud check alert, and I think we get the plus 500 TKO victory right there. If we hit, we hit big, but we got a lot of other stuff to talk about as well. So take that for what it's worth. Now, AJ, of course, we do have to give the people the parlays. Last week, we only had one. This week, we have two. So I'll start off. Um, I like Jamal Emmers by decision and Vina Janjadova versus Lupi Godinez to go over two and a half rounds, combine them together, plus 325 on that parlay. AJ, you got a really interesting one here. Luke versus Buckley over two and a half rounds and Malkoon versus Petrovsky at over two and a half rounds. Seems like safe picks on the surface and we might just hit on those ones. But of course, you know, it's the fight game. Plus 268 though, man. Both of us, we got some fire on the parlays. Did you have any thoughts just on what the theme for these parlays are? Ooh, thoughts on the theme, Derek. I mean, I, I know my pick, or at least yeah. not my, I shouldn't say my pick, the, the Luke yeah. Buckley versus yeah. Malkoon and Petrovsky, both very, very patient fighters, but I really like the Emmers by decision. And same thing with the Jan Shadoba. They're very, very, very patient fighters to win this. So the over makes a lot of sense. And click uh, and cl add that into the Emmers over as well, man, or not over, I should say. Going the distance looks yeah. very well. Looks like a lot of money this weekend in my eyes. That's what it sounds like to me, man. And I just like to leave it at that. Lots of money in the pocketbook, folks. Those are your screenshots. That was your main card picks, your consensus picks, your prop and your parlay. So again, we're not here to mince words. Let's talk about the main card. Let's break down some fights. Let's get it. 
Here's to another main card breakdown, courtesy of your hosts, Derek G and AJ. All right, folks, again, we are here to break them down. We're starting with your main card, breaking it down all the way to the opening bout of the card. But before we do that, of course, friendly reminder, tell a friend to tell a friend. This is your favorite fighter's favorite fight show. We've been doing this, I can't even tell you how many years now, but we have reached episode 277, and that is a hallmark in and of itself. This program would not exist without the fine folks who support it. So if you are truly a supporter, if you're dropping comments, liking, if you're watching, the least you can do is make sure that you hit that subscribe button and make sure that notification bell is on so you don't miss out on any of the episodes, especially the previews and the predictions. That's how the money is made, folks. So smash the subscribe button. I ain't got nothing else to say. AJ, let's break down some fights, baby. Let's kick it off with the first bout of the night. AJ, we had already said it. This is going to be a title eliminator. Aaron Blanchfield, Manon Furo. These are clearly the two best fighters in this division who aren't named Alexa Grasso and Valentina Shevchenko. Like, it's, it's very clear. But what's unclear right here is looking at the odds. You see, minus 140 was the open for Aaron Blanchfield. And I think, mm, yeah, rightfully so. Plus 120 comeback for Furo. Blanchfield holds the grappling edge. But of course, course we have to look at some live odds and the update is blanchfield they're throwing money on her minus 190 is what she has swelled to with a comeback of plus 160 for the french manon furo the the, the Par uh, parisian i guess is what you call it whatever the case may be this is my question to you right here man the difference in this matchup right here versus a lot of the other fights that we've seen from these fighters historically is that this is not an apex cage. This is not a small cage. This is a big one. This is in Atlantic City right here. So movement's going to be on the table. Given that there is so much space for Manon Furo to use that karate blitz style, that footwork to pivot around the cage, and Blanchfield really is going to have to chase her down and try to get her hands on her, do you think that the live odds, again, Manon Furo at plus 160, minus 190 for Blanchfield, do you think that's an acceptable price to pay on either end right there? What are your thoughts with that line? I do actually think it's a very acceptable price for, for both ladies. I mean, uh, plus 160, although it is the comeback from a non Furo, it's not that out of uh, out of reach, if you will. You know, like you said, man, bigger cage, having to control the distance. That's what Manon Furo is going to look to do the entire time. And minus 190 for a surging Blanchfield that's kind of found her moments and found her mark in the in the division. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me, man. I, as long as it's nothing like minus 300, then I'd be a little at awe and see what's going on right here. This makes sense. I will say, I'm going to push back a little bit. I, I think it's uh, it's not terrible. It's not a terrible price to pay, but even if I was a Blanchfield better, I would expect this to be a little closer to even money. And the reason why is because both fighters excel extremely at what it is that they do. Blanchfield, she's going to put the pressure on you, be in your face, try to get her hands on you, and then take you down, right? But she has some decent striking to back it. Furo, on the other hand, her whole entire premise for the entire career thus far is, get your hands off me, <laughs> I'm going to bounce around the cage, I'm going to poke at you, I'm going to win these decisions, or I'm going to hit you with the blitz to try to knock you out. So when, let's just talk about that. Before we jump into the props and anything else, if you look at Aaron Blanchfield, who arguably has the most impressive resume between the two, just came off the Tyler Santos victory, very impressive. Jessica Andrade submits her, Molly McCann, you saw it at JJ Aldridge, Miranda Maverick, right? So, you know, we have some good numbers right there. When you're looking at Furo, the Rose win, eh, she started to gas out towards the end, right? So it was a win, but it was kind of close. Uh, Caitlin Sermonara, Chukagian right there, got the decision fight, decision over the decision fighter right there. Jennifer Maya, Myra Bueno Silva. So I guess now that I take a step back, you tell me, am I correct in that assessment? Is Blanchfield's record more impressive over the last four or five, or are they more on even territory? It, it, when you read the names, Derek, it looks a little even, but I still give the favor to Blanchfield on this one because of where the fighters are at their exact moments, right? The Molly McCann, she's surging. Jessica Andrade, she's looking really good in a lot of her fights and, and not necessarily the old fighters we've seen or the fighters that have kind of stayed stagnant or even even regressed a little bit. I mean, and, and, and no disrespect to the Jennifer Myers or the, or the Caitlin Camineras because – other fighters are just growing and advancing and, and having more shine. I think it gives it a little more last right there, especially in the fact of can whichever one of these fighters, can Blanchfield or can Fioro, do whatever their game plan is to get the fight winning. I give it to Blanchfield on that one, man. And I think that's a fair assessment. I think that's what we're all arguing over for this entire this entire fight night card, right? It's a matter of which fighter will be able to inflict their game plan and do it successfully. So big question. This is the big money question right here. Blanchfield gets her hands on Firo, takes her down. Does Firo get up? Does she survive that ground escapade, if you will? I mean, we haven't seen anything that would say otherwise. Is, well, I guess the hardest question it will be: Blanch, Will Blanchfield be able to get her hands on her? Right? Like, but if she if it does hit the ground, 
I'm, I'm giving the benefit of the doubt to Fiorot right here just because I don't see Blanchfield having the strength and the dominance to just hold her down. I see Blanchfield setting up traps and trying to go for a submission, and that's where the scramble happens, and, the, and then Fiorot stands up. Out of all of the fighters that you've really seen her fight in the last five, six fights, I mean, Myra Bueno Silva would be arguably the one who wants to get her hands on her to take her down the most out of everybody. Baby Shark too, but she was going up a weight class. I don't really count that. Blanchfield has had to fight straight up strikers who are trying to take her head off and has been successful. Jessica Andrade, I know she goes up and down weight classes, but I thought that was a very big win. Now let's do the flip side, the inverse right here. Blanchfield, one thing you got to respect about her, she has a chin. We saw that in the Andrade fight. We saw it in the Tyler Santos fight. She'll get busted up and she'll keep walking right through you. Does the chin, can you rely on that chin though? Because what I see in terms of the durability of the chin is a lack of keeping your head off of that center line. Just like plodding, walking into shots. All love for Aaron Blanchfield. I do believe she will be a champion one day, but I think that Manon Fioro's striking is just at a little bit of a different level. The same way that Blanchfield's grappling is at just a different level than anything Fioro has, has experienced. So what do you think? Yeah, absolutely, Derek. No, I think uh, uh, Blanchfield's going to be in trouble with, with the fact of her not being able to keep her head on the center line, like you're saying. The difference is, is I don't see a knockout coming here for Furo. I see an uh, accumulation of damage, right? And, and just, mm -hmm. just popping that jab or, or throwing the one two, just keeping Blanchfield at bay, but not allowing Blanchfield to slip and then rip and get on the inside. I, th I see Milan Furo doing very well in this fight. That's it. That's why I see the opening odds look a little bit more where my mind would instantly go, but the betters seem to favor Blanchfield on this one. The question is, can she get on the inside? And that's going to be the million dollar question. We won't find out until Saturday night. But one thing that we can do is we can answer one final question before we jump into the props. And that's that both of these fighters, at least in their last 10, neither of them have seen five rounds. Furo, I can't lie. She's given me a little bit of pause in terms of slowing down. And I don't know if you could slow down against Blanchfield because the moment you slow down, she's going to try to get her hands on you. But then the inverse, AJ, if she's trying to get your hands on you for three rounds and can't do it by rounds four and five, do you got the juice to keep shooting takedowns and doing all that? Or is it, you know, you've seen the that's perfect example, not a perfect example, but kind of a really good example. Justin Taffa, his fight against Carl Williams. Carl Williams had to shoot for his life or else he was getting his head knocked off of his shoulders. I'm not saying Fiora presents that threat, but we could see ourselves in that same position. So just give me the one sentence answer, man. Round four hits. Who's the fresher fighter, Blanchfield or Fiora? It's, it's hard to give a one sentence answer. My mind says Blanchfield <laughs> on this one, Derek. Okay. I'm going to go Blanchfield as well. I am going to go Blanchfield. So something's going to have to happen. But over the course of five rounds, that's when we dig into these props. Now, a lot of people are saying Aaron Blanchfield plus 210 submission is criminal, meaning that smash that all day long, right? Like smash it because if she gets Fiora to the ground, it's a wrap. I'm a little more interested, to be honest with you, in these decision plays. Plus 225 for Blanchfield, plus 285 for Fiora. I'm really, really leaning this going the over. And if I have to pull the over up for you right now, the over as it stands is da -da 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 -da. i don't got no drum roll right here four and a half rounds plus money for the over four and a half rounds barely plus 103 minus 133 for under four and a half rounds i have a feeling that's leaning towards like a, a blanchfield submission or a tko what do you think I, it's leaning towards that Blanchfield submission, and at plus 210, it looks really good, Derek, but something in me is just saying, plus 225 decision, or if you're a uh, Fiora better, man, plus 285 looks even better. Something tells me this one might go to decision with the, the cautiousness that the girls are going to take because it's a five-round fight. Yeah, and sorry, folks, if you saw the big screen pop up, I was trying to pull the over and under, but it's at the bottom of the screen. It just it just won't show. But yeah, I completely agree with you, man. So let's not mince any words. What are the props that we like? What are we rolling with? I already said I'm leaning towards the decision on both ends of the spectrum here. But of course, the people, you saw what my pick was in the beginning of the show. Give me Manon Furo. And I think that the fairest bet right here is, listen, she's swollen on the money line. We're not going to play with the props right here. We're just going to stick to straight cash, plus 160 money line, dog play, dog lock, Manon Furo, the beast. I'd love to see it. What do you got? I'm going with the prop, Derek, and I'm taking Blanchfield. I like the decision on this one. Like I said, if, you, if you're feeling confident, you think she can get a submission, by all means, it's right there. I like the decision because of how cautious these fighters are going to be. And then would you give a play? I mean, are you going over or under? Ooh, uh, over.
Over, taking the over, over four and a half. Over. Yeah, over four mm-hmm. and a half right there. And you listen, man, you can always hedge. That's why we ask these questions. I know it's common sense to say if I go decision, it's going to be the over. But if you're like, well, I'll hedge on the under and I'll still place that over bet or the decision bet. It is what it is. But there you have it, folks. That is your main event, UFC Atlantic City. Little bit of contention here on the Bloody Water Podcast, but may the best man win. And everything from here is going to be consensus. So what we're going to do is not argue back and forth on who's going to win, but we're going to find you the most value the value to be found, the money to be found. And when you got 11th ranked Vicente Luque, who has arguably fallen to the lowest ranking that he's had in years, who's giving an opportunity to the unranked Joaquin Buckley, who we know is a savage, but I do think that this is one of those cases of, uh, listen, let's not, or y'all must have forgot Vicente Luque edition. AJ, let's talk about it. Luque, if we're bringing up the record right here, yeah. You dropped a couple, right? You just beat up RDA, decisioned him. That was a beautiful victory right there. You lost to Jeff Neal. You got knocked out, face planted. Durability was so good that your body, your brain just shut itself off. It was like, dude, we can't do this. You know, you're you're too tough. Then he loses to Bilal Muhammad. Aside from that, the last loss was against Wonder Boy back in 2019, man. Buckley, coming off a couple big wins himself, what's the path to victory? Peekaboo style, catch him with the big shot? Is he wrestling? I mean, what what path to victory do we have here for Numansa? For Numansa, that's a, that's a great question, Derek, because that was my first thing. Will he try to wrestle right here? Because if you're going to be playing a game, a striking game with Vicente Luque, man, you were in danger of busting up your calf, busting up your head, really having a rough night. But the thing with Buckley is he has this explosive power to him where you can be going, you guys can be reading, the next thing you know, he's blitzing in on you and doing some serious damage. Or if he's smart on this one, I do think he, he at least shoots for the takedown just to get Luke a little bit more tired or a little bit thinking, could, could Buckley be playing at a different game right here? And then that's when Buckley surprises him, throwing something over the top and actually hurting and doing some damage for Luke. The only thing that worries me about Buckley's wrestling approach is two two fold, right? One, slowing down at the end of round two and round three against Luke, that's going to be a problem because he sets a steady pace, just a very steady, constant pace. Number two, Luke does have a couple of Bravo chokes under his belt. He choked out Michael Chiesa and Tyron Woodley. Tyron Woodley, what was the game plan? Wrestle him up, right? You wrestle him until you get your neck caught and then you're like, oh my God, what am I about to do? I don't really see that being in play for Joaquin Buckley. I see a couple takedowns here and there, but really what I'm more concerned about is, AJ, look at these opening odds. Minus 150 for Vicente Luque, plus 125 for Buckley. Like that that means that people are high on Buckley, at least the betters. If we're looking at the live odds, it's a pick em. This is a coin toss, minus 110, minus 110, a pop. I don't want to be hyperbolic and I don't want to get too, you know, crash and be ahead of myself. Is this the ultimate smash the Vicente Luque, smash the prop, smash the money line. When are you going to get minus 110 odds pick him against a dude who's unranked that we know Luque has stylistic advantages against? You're not, you're not going to get this ever again. And I, this is like you said, Derek, one of those y'all must have forgotten moments for Luke, just because man, people really think that the momentum of Buckley is going to carry him so far, but man, Luke has everything going for him, more calculated, more well-rounded and, and ver- versatile in everything he wants to do. Especially if Luke can control this fight, man, smash whatever, whether it's a money line or the prop, you're making money on this pick regardless. So for those, the, uh, the detractors, uh, if you will, of Vicente Luque, who says his chin is gone, Buckley's going to land the big one, going to knock him out. Well, if you look at the last knockout loss on Luque's record, it was against Jeff Neal. Prior to that, the man, I mean, there's no finished losses in the last 10, man. Like this dude, Luque, I don't understand why people are so low on him right now, but this is one question that I do ultimately have for you. And that for Joaquin Buckley, we know it's going to be the big the big shots, that's his bread and butter, that's his go-to, right? Like, it's the big overarching shots, a lot of power, a lot of athleticism that goes into it. Very much like how in the Andre Fialio fight, he wasn't really winning the fight until he landed the big head kick, and then he, you, you're not winning until you win. That's what MMA is. So are people relying on that? If this goes three rounds, we should be very confident, especially that Luke just beat RDA in a five-rounder, like, handedly. We should be very confident that if this goes the distance, you have to lean Vicente Luque, right? Absolutely, especially with the explosive method that that um, Buckley's looking to take right here. Because yeah, the question is, can he catch Luke in one of those moments? I think Luke is a little too smart for it. That doesn't mean he can't. But I do heavily lean towards Luke in that three round or, or decision style of fight right here. 
And we've seen Buckley a little prone to, to live by the sword, die by the sword. Last two losses have come via knockout. Do you like the plus 230 TKO for Vicente Luque? Because I'm not going to lie. Look at Buckley's TKO prop, plus 255. I thought Luque's prop was going to be like plus 500, plus 550. I thought that's how they were feeling about him. But it clearly goes to show they believe he still maintains that knockout power. So do you like that prop? I like that prop, Derek. Something to, something about me, though, actually likes the submission prop for Luke a little bit more. I know it's higher. I know we might not be able to see it. But if, if things get to where they're chaotic and Buckley starts making some mistakes and he does end up taking Luke down, we can see a submission right here. I don't know if I'm already jumping on that, giving my word that I'm jumping on that submission prop, but I do like the numbers right there. I see a lot of juice and a lot of potential for it. Would you entertain right here? Let me see what it is. Over two and a half rounds is that plus money, plus 132 currently. Do you entertain over two and a half rounds? Absolutely, Derek. If, if you haven't remembered, man, this one's going in my parlay. I think That's this right. one's going right. in the And I, I like that, especially for both sides. I mean, it looks a little better for Luque, plus yeah. 400. But uh, if Numanta can get it done, if he can play that calculated game and do more damage, plus 275 isn't a bad comeback for him. I really like that over. Like, I really, really like that over. Because I think Buckley is durable, man. Yeah, you get caught sometimes, whatever the case, right? And Luke has massive power. But I think Luke is going to respect the power coming back at him from Buckley. So if you don't want to take anything that we're saying for in terms of, like, the pure pick, to roll with the over. Two and a half rounds. We both like Vicente Luque right here. And I will say I think that the best play that you can have is just Vicente Luque minus 110, bro. You're not going to get those odds again. That's the safest play if you're a Vicente Luque backer right there. You want to throw some juice on it, hit the over. Or which one, AJ? Proper decision for Vicente Luque. Woo! Decision. I like the decision, decision, Derek. You heard it. It all makes sense. There you have it. Vicente Luque. Y'all must have forgot. You heard it here first, folks. Moving right on along, the All-American Chris Weidman gets a really interesting matchup against Bruno Silva. Because on one hand, you if you watch MMA, if you're familiar with both of these fighters, you say Chris Weidman trying to make the comeback, not always a graceful story in the sport of mixed martial arts. But Bruno Silva, who was once a crusher, still is. I mean, dude got like, what, 20, 21 knockouts on his record? It hasn't looked good as of late, bro. I mean, you've lost you've lost four of your last five, right? So you lost to uh, Shara Bullet, you lost to Brendan Allen, GM3, and Alex Paeta. Now, what's one thing that we can both agree on here, AJ? That's not a bad cast of fighters to lose to whatsoever. Like, you can't be mad at that. Chris Weidman, on the other hand, losses to uh, Jacare Sauza. Ooh, blast from the past, 2018. Uh, Dominic Reyes, Uriah Hall, Brad Tavares. Again, not a bad cast to lose from, but in the return, that Brad Tavares lost, it was, it was you know, he took advantage of the leg. So that's the first question. Chris Weidman coming off the compromised leg says he feels better than ever. But AJ, hold on. Wait, do we have it? Bro, hold on. <laughs> Chris Weidman says on one hand, hey, I heard this was in Atlantic City. This is the perfect venue for me to take this fight and have my last fight. Why not have it in the place where it all started? Atlantic City, baby, right? And then says, you know what? I was actually feeling good in camp. So I take that back. That's still on the table, but nah, it's not guaranteed. Not what you want to hear from a fighter if you're betting on them. But Bruno Silva, he, I think he's taken a very grappling heavy approach in his training camp. Whole point, man. Plus 220 was the opening odd for Chris Weidman. You look at it right now, plus 190. People are throwing money on Weidman. What do you take for those retirement claims right there or just even the whole thought process? The man is 39 years old. That's what I was going to say, Derek, 39 years old, hitting your 40s, getting to that point in your life where you're asking yourself, why am I still doing this post-surgery, getting beat up by these young guns, facing a, a, an admittedly a dangerous fighter with a lot of KO potential right here, but you can't doubt the heart of Chris Weidman, man. The, the All-American right here is going to show up and going to put his heart on the table and, and get things done as best as he can. We'll see, though, because my, my big question is here, we, we, br we brought it up so many times in all the other shows age man 40 years old do you still have that gassing do you still have that drill that that will that drive to go in there and actually get scrappy and get things done this is the perfect moment for both of these guys to prove that they still belong at a uh, an older age man 35 and above for any fighter is always going to be interesting to see how they perform i'm excited to see how chris weidman does because if he can this is going to be a, a movie moment for him if you will 
This is the biggest concern right here. Yeah, Bruno Silva, he gets Weidman's back against the cage, starts unloading. I could see that minus 170 knockout come easily to fruition. But this is the reality, man. I watched a ton of Bruno Silva tape for this, this week's fight card. The takedown defense is just not there. And we know if Chris Weidman was forcing one thing against Brad Tavares in his last fight, it was the takedown. Now, Tavares had to really work to maintain keeping his back off the fence and shucking off those takedowns, right? And as the fight progressed, Chris Weidman, the cardio never went anywhere, man. He was still in his face the entire fight. So that's what concerns me, man, because I think if Weidman can rack up a couple of the takedowns, this is easily a live dog, but it doesn't feel good to me. Do you feel the same feeling right there? I'm like, the, the logic is there, but when I see this playing out in my head the same way, because I backed Chris Weidman against Brad Tavares, and he got beat up bad. Bruno Silva is Brad Tavares with less takedown defense, but better hands. So what do you think? Yeah, Derek, it, it definitely gives me pause for, for concern if you're a, a Weidman better right here, man, because the only advantage I really give, at least on paper, to Bruno Silva is his age, right? He has that, that youth, the explosiveness, the the durability and the gas tank to go it, but so does Chris Weidman. The only thing that's different is the number right there. Gives me a lot of concern looking at it on paper, but I'm with you. Something tells me, man, it, it, it's a lot more than we can just read off, you know? Do you hedge Chris Weidman here just because? Do you say, Bruno Silva, give me the minus 170 TKO, because I think a lot of people think that that's how this fight's going to play out, even though Weidman's very durable. And then you say, all right, Chris Weidman, he's already out plus money. Or you might take a, a I mean, look at that decision, plus 550, man. Like, I wouldn't be mad at that decision at all. My man doesn't have a ton of dis uh, submission um, I don't know what I just said, submission or decision, but I was meaning submission, plus 550. He doesn't have a ton of submissions under his belt, but if he takes down Bruno Silva, man, you just don't see him do really much to get back up to his feet. And you know the saddest part, bro? This dude's a black belt. You know that, right? He just got his black oh, belt yeah. like a couple fights ago. Like that, That's the saddest part because I'm just like, yo, this is Gregory Rodriguez all over again. I've talked about it before. It's a man who doesn't use his jiu-jitsu the way that he should, but do you hedge Chris Weidman? That's the question. Oh, absolutely, Derek. I was looking at that plus 500 decision specifically for a hedge because as much as I like Bruno Silva betting on this and as much as you want to throw money on that minus 170, it looks good, right? But Chris Weidman is durable and smart enough to not put himself in those situations. It can happen. Anybody can get caught. But if you are looking to hedge, man, that plus 550 looks delicious as well as, I mean, money line plus 220. Can't be mad at that at all. But I really like that decision for Weidman if he's going to pull this one out. And let's not forget, Bruno Silva, I know that he's younger than Weidman, but he's like 35, right? So it's it's not a, the, a major age discrepancy. Um, I'm taking Bruno Silva. AJ, we're rocking Bruno Silva across the board right here. And really, just, I mean, listen, the TKO is there. The money line is right there. But if there's something that you are super confident on that you're like, bro, smash this one, what's the play? Woo, smash this one. Man. I'm not confident in it, Derek, but I'm going to have to say the money line, minus 270. I can see both the TKO and the decision happening for him. That's it. But we'll just leave it at that. Not confident in the play for Bruno Silva. However, that is the pick. Chris Weidman is a hedge. And Bruno Silva, you're not even cashing him at 270 anymore because you're getting him at uh, minus 235. So take that for what it's worth right there, folks. This should be a really fun one. But just know the path to victory for Chris Weidman is incredibly clear. Just take him down, beat him up with some ground and pound, and we could easily see a live dog right here. But AJ... I told you in the beginning, there's going to be some exposing going on this week. There's going to be a real live dog. And if there's any live dog on this entire card right here, I am declaring it right now. Cedricus Dumas is that live dog. Nursultan Ruzi Boyev, apologies. Listen, this dude has a fantastic record. Um, he looked awesome against Bruno Fajeda. But if you watch the tape back, AJ, I was watching it back. The length definitely helps, right? When you're the tallest, longest dude in the division, you catch the kick or whatever, you flip the man on his head, he smacks the back of his head on the canvas and eats a couple follow-up shots. It was an easy TKO, right? How impressed were you with that victory? Were you so impressed that you bring him in as a damn near minus 300 favorite against a killer like Cedricus Dumas? Like, are, were you that level of impressed? Not at all, Derek. Not that level impressed one bit. Yeah, it was was the situation that occurred in the in the Fajeda fight amazing. It looked good. It looked great. It looked like perfect timing and a, and a killer instinct to how to get things done. But if you look at just the 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 style of how it all unfolded it wasn't much of a trap or it wasn't much of a setup or it wasn't a dominant performance from the jump by uh by uh, Ruzboyev, but it can happen, man. I, I mean, the, the numbers, the only thing that worries me about Rizboyev, man, is the the amount of numbers in his uh, in his record. What is it, like 30, 33 Maybe. and 8 and 2 with one note with, or sorry, 33 mm -hmm. and 8, 2 with 2 no contest. It sounds 
a little fishy and especially coming from Russia. So I'm, I'm excited to see where this dude stands because if it's not fishy, we're in for a hell of a fight right here. Well, AJ, you brought up a fantastic point, and I think we should bring up the big screen because this right here, my friend, this is my man's record, um, and I did some deep diving. Just I'm sure the same way that you're like, let me let me look into this a little bit. So, folks, what you can see right here is you're going to see the um, records of the fighters that he fought at the time of fighting them. So the biggest win to date right here, Bruno Fajeda, 10, uh, 10 and 0, right? Yeah, undefeated record. He snatched that. He, he, he starched them, right? Then you start seeing the fight before that. All right, you got some six submissions. And folks, this will all be zoomed in, so you'll see it. 12 and 12 for the fighter before. 13 and 4. This was actually a really good fight. But the Kimura that I saw this man lock up was the most white belt Kimura I've ever seen in my life. You shoot, you instantly take. It was, it, listen, man, that, it was a disappointing loss there. Uh, 15 and 2. Knocked him out early. All right, cool. Then the records start degrading, right? So right here, what do we got? 20 and 10. 4 and 4. 8 and 3. 10 and 8. 20 and 25. 18 and 11. 26 and 24, 0 and 1. This one was 1 and 0. 6 and 0, 6 and 4, 7 and 0, 8 and 5, 18 and 4. It just goes on and on and on, AJ. And if you keep looking at it and you really, really dive deep, you're like, yeah, you, you did not have the greatest you know, opponents to select from right here. This is kind of like Habib's record before he actually started fighting like top-notch opposition. Like This is just what you had to fight. So this number, I think, is impacting a lot of people's perceptions. Because they're seeing this and they're like, oh, this dude must be a killer. 33 wins, only eight losses. It's just a matter of taking a step back and saying, well, who did he fight? And what was the method of the victory? Because if you look through and through, it's tons of TKOs, Kimuras, submissions and all that. First round, first round, first round, second round. Cedricus Dumas, I'm not saying that this dude is just some like, you know what I mean? ultra elite fighter that's a number one contender type situation but listen this dude will knock you out he'll submit you his intangibles his athleticism i think that this is just a tailor-made matchup to say all right well ruz Boyev, normally you're the taller longer fighter you're at a reach disadvantage you're you're still taller he's six five right but he's got shorter reach right so now you're going to be fighting somebody who could play your game now your number one path to victory is you better get him to the ground because if you don't i'm really interested to see how the fight plays out and that's why aj we take a look back and we say minus 290 was the opening odds for ruzi boyev and apologies if i'm just butchering that name but the now the line now live minus 210 for ruzi boyev plus 175 for dumas money is coming in this, I just checked yesterday. Dumas was at plus 190 yesterday. Now, plus 175. If you were smart, you took him at plus, I got him at plus 210. I didn't even get him at plus 235. So the point here, long monologue aside here, AJ, are we right for digging into the record and saying, what is the real path to victory for Ruzi Boyev? Because you didn't see anything in the UFC fight. And I'm interested if you watched as much tape as I did on his outside fights, because it's not what you would look at from the record. What do you think? Oh, absolutely, Derek. And I don't want to discredit because because uh, the Ruz Boyev, that, that record might be legit, right? There might be a lot of fighters in there that have uh, that are legitimate killers out there. Right? It's nothing to take away from him. It's just a cause of it, it raises a couple eyebrows. And what makes me most excited is this is a great fight for Ruz Boyev to actually show that, hey, man, all that shit was real back there. I'm smashing people left and right. And if he does good more credit to him man because then then we're going to be really looking at this guy and we're not going to get him for a minus 290 it's going to be like a minus 500 at some point going forward if he can get it done i don't think man i'm, I'm ex that's why i'm so excited to see this fight because i do think like you said man dumas right here is a is a heavy sleeper heavy underdog man a live dog in this fight that is a perfect moment for the one of those ones where he's waking you up right and, and i'm not saying waking you up by realizing oh this guy's real i'm saying waking you up in the back of the room because you're sleeping as you exit the cage dumas yeah. might be able to get this one done 100%. And that's my prop lock on the night. Plus 500 TKO, Cedricus Dumas, man. Listen, look at how he wins the majority of his fights. It's by knockout, right? That's how he gets the job done. So I just think right here, and again, to, to kind of parrot what you said right there, no discrediting Ruz Boyev whatsoever. It's a matter of looking at UFC ready competition. Did all of your time in all of the regional promotions outside of the UFC prepare you for even a nine and one fighter in Dumas who hasn't even had that many fights, man? But if you look at it, Abu Azatire, Josh Fremd, and Cody Brundage. I'm not saying that this is the cream of the crop here, AJ, but what I am saying is those are three legitimately tested fighters in the UFC. 
Ruz Boyev, I have yet to see him pass the actual test. And that might sound crazy when you say, well, he just knocked out Bruno Fajeda. What do you mean? But if you watch how the fight played out, did the fight ever really get started? And this dude was what? You know, had like a 10-inch reach advantage. This dude super short. I don't know. I'm just saying. So that's my play. Cedricus Dumas, plus 500. Very passionate. If you're not happy about that, literally just take him out the plus money. Like it's super simple in terms of the equation right here. This is the one I've been struggling on here, AJ. This is the play that I want your opinion on. If you take a look, and I'm bringing up the big screen right here, and we look at the, the overs, over one, and a, over one and a half rounds is plus money. And I'm just like, man, I want to smash that. But on the other hand, I could see a knockout happening quick. And then if Ruzaboyev is as good as he is, as everybody is saying that he is, couldn't you see an early, take him down, submit him, right? So what is your thoughts on the over and under? Because that's given me the hardest, hardest time throughout this entire matchup. Yeah, that is that is does give me a little bit of hard time right there, Derek, because instantly I see the under as being and, and that's why the odds makers see it as well as a minus 145. Um, I see that being the most likely outcome with both uh, fast starters right here is Dumas. You know, I don't see Dumas really giving this guy a lot of respect, at least initially, maybe he gets cracked up a little and then he has to play the actual game. But I see Dumas coming in here and really putting a hurt on. And the same thing going across, man, is uh, Ruzboyev needs to be able to do some damage. And he can get a submission early or a knockout early. It's not un unlikely, especially with if his record does hold up like it does, man. A lot of first-round finishes. Fair play. Cedricus Dumas is the play for the Bloody Water Podcast. And then we will keep it pushing right on along. Senior Perfecto, he gets one against Kyle Nelson. So maybe not the big name that he was kind of clamoring for, right? But you got a tough Kyle Nelson. It's funny because I always call him an old man. This dude's like 32 years old. He's been in the UFC for a while, since 2018, not even that long. It's been like six years. He just seems like a very established with a bald head. Maybe that's what it is. But listen, man, Senior Perfecto opens up at minus 190. Currently has swollen, AJ. Minus 245, plus 200 comeback for Kyle Nelson. What's the path to victory right here if you're Bill Algeo? Because if there's one prop that I love right here, I love plus 115 decision, Bill Algeo. I say you take the golden Thor's hammer, maybe silver, whatever, and you smash that thing all day long. What's the path to victory for Bill Algeo? What's nice for Algeo is he has a couple different paths to victory, and I see him, especially in the big cage, controlling that uh, controlling that link, controlling the distance, and just pecking at Kyle Nelson, getting him a little agitated, not allowing Nelson to put this fight, you know, push him up against the cage or, or control him in any sort of way, and really just making this a more aggravating fight for Kyle Nelson. Because if you let Nelson get going, he's going to be have that snowball effect and really get things working. The good thing for Algeo, though, if Nelson is able to get his hands on him, Dude's a black belt, so he's not too worried right there going into this. So we're going to be able to see how LG was able to play both sides of the fight game right here and see where some real high fight IQ comes into play. I would agree through and through. I think Algeo needs to be first. I think he needs to not let Kyle Nelson establish his rhythm. Don't let Nelson be on the front foot because that's going to be just a recipe for, for problems. But this is going to be my biggest thing. I always feel like Algeo starts the fights off fantastic and then as rounds two and round three because he's gone eight of his last 10 fights through decision, right? Round two and round three, he starts getting hittable. He starts getting pieced up a little bit. He starts staying in the pocket a little too long. So I'm just hoping he removes himself from the pocket because Kyle Nelson can crack and he can hurt you, whether it's a leg kick or a big bomb up top. But I think for Kyle Nelson, you're probably going to have to get a finish. I don't see grappling being the approach to winning this fight. And as long as Bill Algeo can stay crafty for 15 solid minutes, I think he gets the job done. Again, I'm staying away from the money line. And I really, really like that plus 115 decision. I can't say enough how much I like it. So I say smash it while it's still plus money. What do you think, AJ? I think smash that decision as well. And, and what I think can happen right here, if you're a Nelson better, just the control up against the cage and mitigate that length that Algeo is going to try to fight. So the yeah. same thing on the other end, Algeo is going to be looking to show out and make some some fancy moves to be able to create a little bit of distance right here, making it really a calculated fight. Plus 115 decision sounds great. Let's not forget the big cage, Atlantic City. I mean, it's in the favor of Bill Algeo. So that's the pick right there. Another Bloody Water, another bloody water Podcast consensus pick. And then AJ, we got another one right here, my man. But this one, normally you would almost feel like this is a layup. And if you look at the odds, you would definitely indicate Smash Bot, Chitty, and Jaquani. But then you look at the matchup and you're like, wait, hold on. Chitty, this guy was fighting Gregory Rodriguez and, and, and you know what I mean? Uh, uh, Michael Alexachuk, Albert Durayev, Reese McKee, that dude's 170. Oh, yeah. By the way, Chitty and Jaquani dropping down to 170 pounds for the first time since 2016. There's been some weight misses, some weight issues on his end. I believe he has missed weight for 185 pounds as well. So before... We jump into this matchup here, folks. There is a potential that, I mean, we got to make it to the fight before we could talk about the fight, right? Weigh-ins need to go accordingly. 
I'm going to say this. I was talking with AJ, and this is a transparent platform, right? So we were talking right before we recorded this, and we said if there's one, one pick we might reverse, it might be this one given the context, but let's talk about it because we haven't changed any picks, and we say Chitty and Jaquani, the game plan versus Reese McKee is you have to get him out of there early. First round, Chitty is the most dangerous Chitty you have available. Coming down from 185, as long as that chin holds up a little bit, the power is going to be a major advantage in his case. The only problem here, AJ, to almost a fault, Reese McKee is a very durable fighter. Very, very durable fighter. And I see this, if Chitty doesn't get him out of there first, I see Reese McKee putting him away in rounds two or rounds three, just war of attrition. Am I wrong? Am I right? What are your thoughts? You're right, Derek. And this one, especially if you're a Reese McKee better, the 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 longer he can make this fight last, the more dangerous he's going to be. And especially if uh, Chitty's weight cut, you know, going down 170, it impacts him a little bit more than he thinks. Yeah, he might be there. He might get to the actual fight. But if your brain's a little dehydrated, you're you're hurting a little bit going in there, the chin could be a little faulty too. It does give a lot of pause for concern, especially, man, with three losses in Chitty's last uh, last five fights. Or last three fights are all losses, man. This dude's going in on a skid right here. He needs this fight. Hopefully, the new weight class can be the thing that energizes him and rejuvenates him. But he's also going to get up against not only a durable fighter, but a very powerful striker too going into this and Reese McKee has some length to him man 15 pounds is a lot of pounds bro that's a lot of pounds it's not uh, I mean this is the Kevin Holland this is the Joaquin Buckley they were making they were getting by at 185 they go down to 170 and the success just at least for Buckley the success skyrockets for Holland he still had some really interesting matchups that you know kind of played out a little bit differently I just think that the power is going to be massive because Reese McKee is a very hittable fighter and that's what we're applauding him on the toughness the durability but the question is Chitty is a sniper. So Reese McKee normally enjoys a couple of different intangibles, attributes that he won't against Chitty. One, um, Chitty is the taller fighter in this matchup, which is probably strange to him at 170, given that Reese McKee, Skeletor, is 6'2", Chitty 6'3". Chitty's reach is 80 inches, Reese McKee's is 78. So literally all of those advantages out the window. Chitty holds the advantage. I think if you're Reese McKee, you, now you have to make your way on the inside and you have to fight on the inside, but that's not really how he fights. So when it comes down to the teep kicks and the sniping shots of Chitty and Jaquani, do you think that any of that, do you think that the gas tank pretty much, it was already, already like kind of at one round. Are we thinking we got a good three and a half minutes to get this man out of here? Do you think after that three and a half minute mark or so, it's all downhill or can we see a surprise from a rejuvenated Chitty and Jaquani? We could see a surprise, Derek, especially if uh, how he's going about his weight cut right here is intelligent, right? And then he's able to make it last a little longer. Now he has all the strength and all the power he had, but he weighs 15 pounds less, and he's feeling good about going into that. We could see a rejuvenated Chitty. I'm, I'm not saying I'm banking on it. I'm not saying I'm putting the money on the decision. I think that's why the, the, the odds makers had the minus 125 TKO. I think we're all thinking one round Chitty's a star, but it could happen, man. I, we, we've seen crazier happen out there. This is what I will say. I think Reese McKee lacks one tool that a lot of the other fighters who have beaten Chidi and Jaquani recently have been able to push the pace with, and that's the grappling. I don't see McKee going in trying to wrestle him up. So if this is like a pure kickboxing match, a pure Muay Thai match, if you will, I like my odds on Chidi and Jaquani. Big asterisk, just because of the weight cut, man. We're unproven. You're 35 years old. You haven't cut down to this weight class in eight years it's just that that's normally not a good recipe for success. So normally I would say stay away, but for the purpose of this matchup right here and for this program, Chitty and Jaquani is the play. Minus 125 TKO is not the play. We are not going to be touching that, but I will safely uh, take just Chitty and Jaquani and uh, just, you know, play the safe bet, man. Where is he at right now again? Minus 140. This is getting closer to a pickup, man. Plus 120. Come back for Reese McKee. Let me say that one more time. Chitty opened at minus 235. He is close to close at minus 140. So, AJ, before we leave here, are we sure? Are we sure about this? We can't let the odds makers deter you, but are we sure about this? Man, I had the same thought, Derek, especially because <laughs> I can see this fight going to decision and all the arrows are pointing to Reese McKee and we might be eating crow on Monday. Yeah. But man, I still something in me tells Chitty can get that knockout. I'm, I'm not saying I'm, I'm blanking it in on minus 125. I just think, man, he could. It's there. We'll see. I like him at minus money for the odds uh, for the money line. 
I just don't want this to be Billy Cornsillo versus Yusuf Zalal all over again. Because we called it. We're like, Zalal is, I mean, bro, that, he's there. And what does he do? He goes out and just puts on a dominant performance. But that's neither here nor there. Chitty is the play. And that's your main card breakdown, UFC Atlantic City. We spent the majority of the time here on the main card. Folks, wanted to give you an in-depth breakdown. But you know there's more to come. You know that we need to talk about the unknowns of today and the stars of tomorrow. Let's not mince any words. Let's jump into some sleepers. Let's get it. It's time for some fight night. If you ain't paying attention, well, you're gonna sleep on me and I'm gonna wake you up. You heard the king. He said what he said, and he's not taking it back. And we don't take it back here on this program right here. We want to show you a couple of sleepers on the prelims where you go and you're kicking it with the boys, right? It's the y'all in the living room or you're at your local sports bar. The prelims are playing and everyone's tuned out. They're on their phones. They're on Tinder swiping, whatever. And you're like, put the phone down, brother, right here. This fight, banger alert. And then the banger happens. Yeah, you look like the coolest guy ever. So, AJ, I'm bringing up the big screen. Ebo Aslan versus Anton Turkali, the pleasure man right here. Set the table, brother. What do we got right here? Man, this one's going to be a very fun fight and a quintessential sleeper right here, folks. I'm putting you on to Ebo Abo, however you actually pronounce his name, but Aslan, man, this dude is very dangerous. He's a brutalizer. He's going to come in there headhunting and looking to really do some damage. And against a, a, a fighter that we thought was going to be one of the upcoming uh, stars, man, Tergali had a lot of praise to him. But now on a three-fight, two-fight skit, I forget exactly what it is, but he's going to be hungry. He's going to be looking to make a mark, and I think that's what's going to provide a lot of the action right here. A desperate man trying to get back what was his and a young fighter looking to take everything that somebody else got. Adds for a lot of fun. Don't blink on this one, folks. Don't blink whatsoever. That is absolutely a banger in store for you. And then I got a banger right here. Here it is right here. Angel Pacheco versus Kowlin Lofren. Now, I butchered the name, but I'm not butchering what we have right here. Listen, if you remember once upon a time, there was a fighter who was like flipping off all the fans and the camera, and he was really brash and all of that stuff. That's this guy. This is the Don Lofren right here, right? And what do you notice? He came off of a loss to Taylor Lapalus in Paris. It was Paris. That's where it was. It was in France, and he was flipping off all the French fans, right? Well, guess what, man? We got a dude in Angel Pacheco right here who, I don't know if you guys watched this fight. Danny Silva versus Angel Pacheco. This was a banger. Danny Silva was a heavy favorite. I actually cashed a bet on Pacheco, lost the bet because I thought this dude was going to be able to outdog him. He brought the dog. He just didn't outdog him. He gets his rep, uh, retribution. He gets a UFC shot coming off of a decision loss. How often does that happen off the Dana White Contender Series? It doesn't happen very often, but we found ourselves with an absolute dogfight. This dude, Lofren, has a lot of, how would you say, bravado, a lot of machismo. Pacheco, pure backyard bulldog that you will sick on anybody. They're going to meet in the middle. I have a feeling first to shoot, so you know what? And I think that Lofren is going to be the first to shoot. I'll just say that right there. So expect violence. I'm hoping we see a TKO right here, but that's the play for the sleeper. We just gave you two. We set the table for you, fantastic. That was awesome. All right, AJ, one last thing that we need to do here. We're actually running short on time. We went a little bit longer on the main card than normal. So, of course, you know what the deal is. We're going to bring up the big screen once more. And instead of uh, talking about these uh, prelims or these uh, main card, we're going to bring up the prelims. Don't have a lot to run through right here. But, AJ, I want to give a friendly reminder from this feature prelim. Nate Landwehr, Nate the Train, we love him, versus Jamal Emmers. I have the decision prop, Jamal Emmers. The last time that I checked, and I forget what it is now, but it's somewhere in the realm of like a plus 200 or something like that. We're smashing, AJ. We're eating on that one. Do you think Nate the Train, who's a plus 155 dog, knocks out the boy Jamal Emmers? Or what are we seeing here? No, I think uh, Jamal Emmers keeps this one pretty, man. Keeps this one looking clean. And as much as Nate Landwehr is going to try to make this one a bulldog dirty fight, I think uh, Jamal Emmers is going to be able to literally just maintain just a little bit more control than the chaos that's coming out of the landwehr side i think so too man i think jamal emmers is going to be a fantastic play right here i think he should be a bigger favorite i love some nate the train you know we've talked about him extensively but i think jamal emmers in a technical fight is is levels above he's shown it time and time again all right AJ, we have to talk about it, right? Vina Janjadoba, Lupi Godinez right here. It's fine. The time has come. Vina Janjadoba seems to be that in, impenetrable wall that people just cannot pass time and time again. Lupi Godinez is on a hot streak. This is going to be the wrestler grappler versus the pure wrestler. Who gets the job done right here? What do we like about this matchup? 
Man, what I like about this matchup is the unknowns, Derek. I instantly lean loopy on this one, but Vernage and Jadoba is one of those ones. Like you said, man, a, a wall right here. Just a, a stone wall that cannot be passed unless you have supreme skill. And at least up to this point, Lupi Godinez hasn't done anything that's going to blow me out of the water to make me say she's going to blast Janjadoba in this one. And let me pull this up. This is a cool new little feature from... Uh... Oh, it doesn't show it. It was a cooler feature from Tapology. Now they show you a little bit more information. They give you the matchup page, though. Look at this, man. Vina Janjadoba, 3-2 and two, uh, in her last five. 4-1 and one for Loopy. Her losses to Angela Hill. For Vina Janjadoba, Amanda Hibas, and Mackenzie Dern. But the point is here, she got that big win over Marina Rodriguez, Angela Hill. So she was able to, you know, get right right there. And I think that Vina Janjadoba, one thing about her, man, is that her hands have just been... Her hands are getting crispier and crispier. And when it comes down to the ground game, a lot of people don't want to mess with her. Lupi Godinez, she wants to get you up against the cage, drop you a million times. This might be a striking match. And that's where things really get interesting. So, I, folks, strap in. This is going to be a fun one. But either way you see it, I think they're going to be tough enough where that over two and a half smashes all day. You love it. AJ, your turn, my friend. What do you like here? Pick out a, pick out a bout and we'll, we'll run through it. Man, the one I want to talk about right there is actually my prop lock, Connor Matthews versus Dennis Bazooka. I like it, man, because these guys, they're young, they're exciting, but they're going to be over there trying to find a way to actually make a big move going into this one. I mean, and Bazooka, as much as talent he's had, was on like a two-fight losing streak. He needs the performance in this one. And going up against a, uh, a brash Connor Matthews, I see a finish coming right here or, well, uh... I don't know, man. It's hard. It's hard to say. I, I said I see a finish because I, I like the way Connor Matthews fights. The over does look good. Uh, I think this is going to be a fun run right here. This dude came in with a lot of hype, Dennis Bazookia. I know he kind of came in on like a short notice type situation, but that should be a fun one. And really, the only other one that I wanted to bring up right here, man, was Melissa Gatto versus uh, Victoria Dudikova. I don't know if you remember. I'm pretty sure Dudikova was. <laughs> <laughs> pretty sure she was the fighter who after her last win let me pull it up just so i can confirm because i don't want to say anything crazy um uh, after her last win yeah that's right to Jin Yu fry she was like my my pants are bloody she had white pants on too she said my pants are all bloody i had staph infection all over my ass cheeks it was a really weird situation right here man so she came in on some weirdness but it was an impressive victory against Jin Yu fry let's not forget though Jin Yu fry if she could compete at her optimal weight it'd be at 105 pounds not at 115 and now she runs into a fighter who's on a two fight losing streak but who we know is legit as ever melissa gato fantastic jiu-jitsu uh, fantastic striping or striking last two losses tracy cortez and ariani lipsky not bad losses whatsoever does she end the hype train of dudakova and i say the answer is yes just given that listen she's a favorite right here man due to kova i think that the hype they, they're recognizing melissa gato is no joke man so what do you think no i think uh gato gets the finish where maybe not even the finish but actually ends the eight no streak we take that that o from uh, dujakova but don't sleep on dujakova man she can get this done in, in a patient way right here i like melissa gato though yeah, I like Melissa Gatto all day right here. All right, folks, I think that's a fair conclusion right here now that we're almost at the hour mark. So we made it to another outro. We covered all the most important things. Where the money is truly made, those bets have been covered. We've given you props. We've given you parlays. We hit you with the money line. And we hit you with the sleepers. Like, we gave you the full gambit. So the gentleman's agreement is very clear. AJ, I'm sure you're on deck as well. Given that, we have spent all week providing value, researching, film study to be able to put money not in only your pockets but of course in our pockets this is an incentivized program here we ask for one thing subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet and you're at this point of the program i mean you must love us that much i don't know what else you tuned in for but aj talk to the people get us out of here We've said it before, folks, everybody out there, they're not keeping their stats up for you. They might throw out a nice little, oh, go and check this one out. Maybe you might win some money. You're winning money right here. That's the whole reason we're doing it for you. We'd be doing this regardless, but because of you fine folks keeping us here, growing that number, that's why we like to thank you with money in your pockets, man. Greenbacks feel the best when they're sliding down. So that's what we're here for, putting greenbacks in that wallet. Now all you got to do is, like Derek said, gentlemen's agreement, go and share it with your friends, make everybody else some money, but then come back here and give us the good thank you and we'll be here week in and week out for you to make more money each time couldn't have said it better myself there's no cherry picking on this program you get the wins you get the losses and everything in between but we know it's a lot more wins than losses here all right folks catch us on monday for the ufc atlantic city post show we will be recapping all of the bets that took place along with the hottest headlines of the week that's it for us until next time peace